that was the first time where I was like, I wasn't at the office making money. I was at the movies making money. Like that is awesome. It's true capitalism, digital capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, this is what like owning a business really feels like or should, where you're not trading your time for money. Right. So that I was really hooked at that moment. And I was like, whoa, this is sweet. This is the Vance Quo Podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm glad you're here. This is a very special 10th episode of the Vance Crow podcast. And so to celebrate, I decided to invite one of my closest friends, a man named Chris Oliver, in to have a conversation. You know, it's a little bit difficult to have a conversation with somebody that you know as well as I know Chris. I've known him for about as long as I've lived in St. Louis, about eight or nine years. And ever since we became friends, I have always turned to Chris whenever I've had a challenge with my business, with uh, trying to expand my speaking career, and I bring him these challenges, often with a solution that I have in mind, and he always has kind of a zen way of unpacking what I'm thinking about and giving me a new way to think about it. And that's what I think is so interesting about today's interview. You'll hear us talk about some of the basics, what is a computer programmer and what do they do all day, but you'll quickly notice how Chris, the way that he explains things, opens up concepts in a really deep and interesting way. Chris is an adventurer and an entrepreneur, both doing computer programming here in St. Louis, but also out in New York City, out in Germany, and has even been invited to Silicon Valley to interview with some of the top venture capital firms in the entire world. He is a very soft-spoken but uh, interesting guy, and if you stay all the way to the end, you hear some of how he finds his new ideas and new interesting people uh, to listen to. And I think one of Chris's greatest uh, gifts is his ability to find new things on the internet that other people haven't seen before. So I hope you enjoy this 10th uh, episode of the Vance Crow Podcast. I'm really glad you're here, and enjoy the episode. Chris Oliver, one of my closest friends, uh, somebody I've known for g- uh, close on a decade, almost, 70 years, while. something like that. Yeah. Um, the uh, business owner here in St. Louis, computer programmer, and uh, and we can talk all about that. But actually, I think, when I think of you, I actually think of you as probably one of the most adventurous people that I know. And I mean, like, I used to live on a ship and traveled in Africa, but I remember after we met... Um, you had been working for a company and then suddenly you were like, you know what, I got to move to New York City and you were off and then Germany and then San Francisco and you've just been riding the tech wave. So welcome to the podcast. I'm glad you're here and let's... Uh, Thanks let's... for having me. Oh man, it's it's uh, it's pretty cool to have your friends on your podcast, yeah. but it also makes it a little bit difficult because I already know a lot about your background, but maybe just to get started, because when I put out that I was going to do this interview, I said, I'm going to interview a computer programmer. What should I ask them? And really, it came down to like, what is a computer programmer? Like, are you, Mm -hmm. you know, what are you doing in your day to day job? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And it's probably a hard one to kind of imagine for most people. Like, my parents had the hardest time understanding what I was doing for a long time. But like, you really just sit down and you're you're kind of translating like if you give me an idea for some software, um, like a calendar, right? Something as simple as that. Well, you have to translate that into something the computer can understand, which is just ones and zeros. And it knows that here's this, we have a screen connected and we need to draw boxes. And so like you have to remember like the calendar is a series of boxes in a grid, but some of them have dates that are in the current month, some are in the previous month. And you have to go through all of these things and see like, you know, when you think of a calendar, you just think of, you know, it just is a calendar. But when you really have to break it down as a programmer, you have to say like, okay, well, the first of the month starts on Wednesday, which means I have to draw boxes for the last several days of the previous month as well. You know, so you have to break all the stuff down finer and finer and think about every little detail of it. Whereas normally you just kind of brush it off and you're like, that's what the month looks like. But you don't realize the nuances and all that. So programming ends up being a lot like, you know, engineering a building or anything like that where you have to worry about like, you know, 
if you're building a house, like the floor is being supported by this. And we have to keep in mind how much weight that must support and all of those things. But when you think about a house, you're like, oh, there's a post there. Like, that's just how it is. And yeah, programming is very much that, but you're translating that into commands and rules for the computer to understand, which are actually just pretty simple. But, you know, uh, in, it ends up being this thing where you're like, when you're designing a house, you're not thinking, of, you are thinking about physics kind of at the very end. And that's kind of how we're dealing with computers. Like that's the very last thing that you're worried about. You know, I don't have to worry about the ones and zeros and building in a, you know, building, you know, I have to worry about physics as much, but you do have to think about it and keep it in mind. So it's like an interesting, you know, <clears throat> It's just a really interesting set of problems where you're really translating these things from how humans think about it, which tends to gloss over so many things into something that the computer will do literally exactly what you tell it to. And if you tell it to do something wrong, it will happily do that, you know, and it's not going to be like, oh, you I think you meant this. I think one of the biggest like roadblocks for me, even as a person that has several friends that are in computer programming is that it seems, because every computer programmer I've ever used is comes fully baked. I already have the calendar. I already have everything. <coughs> so it seems like everything's already made. All the problems are already fixed. All you need to do is make the pictures go where I want and the, and the text to go where I want. So mm-hmm. it's really hard to imagine that there are new programs that you can build you know, that are from unique. scratch. Yeah, yeah, that are unique. Well, you have to think about, and we talked about this a little bit last night, talking about Squarespace. Like, you can buy software like Squarespace where you can drag and drop anything there. But the problem is that if you want to build something unique, Squarespace has built a certain number of features and a very small number of things because you have infinite possibilities with software. It's like going to the hardware store, like, what can you build with everything in here? kind of infinite things. So the same thing applies to programming. So you end up with a, it's like writing as well, where you have a set of words that you can use in the English language. What can you make with that? Literally anything, right? So programming ends up being the same way for that same reason. You have these fundamental tools that you can use in a million different ways. And so something like Squarespace is designed for certain types of sites But you couldn't build Facebook on Squarespace. You couldn't build Amazon on Squarespace because they haven't built that stuff in in the way it needs to operate. So, like, if you wanted to build eBay, you have to have sellers, you have to have buyers, you have to have bids, auto bidding, you know, photo uploading and all this stuff. And, like, it's very hard to build generic software that can just, like, drag and drop and build something like that. So you have to build you know, custom stuff to make that even possible. So software ends up being that thing where you have to be very creative because you're trying to think about how do I take this idea and then translate it to something something that the computer can understand, but also make it flexible so we can change it in the future. Because you can also walk yourself into a corner and be like, well, we built it this way, but now you want this other feature and we have to redo the whole thing because we didn't build it with that in mind. It's like making an Excel spreadsheet where you've got the the cells going connected and then you're like, oh, wait, but if you want to add that thing in, that calculation, I didn't set it up like that. I'm going to have to reverse yeah, engineer it, tear exactly. it out. Okay. Yeah, That's- I mean, Excel, if anybody's used Excel, like you are programming. You just don't have to worry about variables because effectively the cell itself is the variable. So, like, you were genuinely programming when you're connecting things and doing calculations and tables and all that stuff in Excel. So, a lot of people go from Excel into programming because they're, like, getting to a point where it's hard to do in Excel or just frustrating or something. And then they find Python or something. And they can go program that and make it a lot cleaner and a lot faster and just, you know, more flexible. So, then sometimes that turns into, like... You build the logic, the calculations, and then you build a web interface so that you can go use it in a browser. And then all of a sudden you have a product you could sell, which is super cool. So like it gives you a lot of freedom to go do and solve like any problem you could probably imagine, at least if if it's virtual. 
So you're teaching now, uh, you have your, your business, which is, uh, I mean, we can describe it as, you can describe it as com- complicated, but, but at the core, it is you capturing your screen, doing coding, and then if your face up there where you're d- looking directly into a camera and you're talking people through complex coding challenges, mm-hmm. is that, is, would you say that's accurate? Yeah, yeah, I am just trying to, so so there's this concept of pair programming, where two people sit at the same computer and try and work on a problem. So even though you're not there, when you're watching my videos, you're not there with me while I'm recording it, it feels that way, because you get to sit with me and see my screen, and I can walk you through everything. And so that turns out to be like a great way to learn to code, because you can go and listen to me explain it. But then you can also go and follow along, but then modify it for what you're trying to do. So if I'm doing a, like those buttons to log in with Twitter, you might say, well, I don't want Twitter. I want log in with Facebook. And you can go and modify it to connect to Facebook instead. But the concept is all the same. So my videos end up being, you know, rather, they're specific as they're recorded, but they're kind of generic in that sense because you can apply it and modify it. And it's really teaching you those concepts to have in your head on how to approach a problem. So they end up being kind of um, educational in that way because they're you can watch me do something, but it might just spark up an idea on how to solve a totally different problem. Because you're like, ooh, that's interesting, you know? And that was actually where I ended up learning a lot of my programming. There was another guy years ago who did a thing called RailsCasts. And I was working at a really small company here with five people. And I was doing, you know, a lot of these same features. This guy's publishing videos every week. And there were some times where I'd be given a project. And then the day before, that guy had published a video on it. And I could go watch that and be like, oh, this is amazing. Like, this is the exact thing I need. And so he did that for a few years and then quit. And uh, it was like a year and a half later or something. And I was like, I want to stop consulting and I want to run my own business. And I worked with a friend um, on a little side project that we made some decent money, but it didn't. It didn't go over well in the long run because he was spending all that money on ads to make the money. So uh, that fell apart, but it gave me I remember me the t- that. I remember yeah. that. You want to talk about that? That was a we funny We can talk adventure. about that. Yeah. So this is <laughs> it's really funny because like, his idea was um, on your phone, mobile apps, there are so many of them that it's become – it's become easier to make $50 or even $5 from an app than it is to make, uh, or, or rather $5 from a thousand apps than it is to make one app that makes $5,000. So like what people were doing was buying a template for an iOS app or an Android app or something. And then sharing that, uh, with a designer who would go theme the solitaire game as like a safari version. And then you would make 10 different copies of that that were like a safari version, a space solitaire, or whatever, you know. And then publish all of those and put your ad network in there and attempt to make very little money, but just publish a lot of different versions of the exact same thing. And so the problem with doing that was you need reviews to get ranked at all in the search results on the App Store. So we built this little thing where you could pay us five bucks and review other people's apps, and your app would go up in the queue, so you would get reviews faster the more reviews you gave. And uh, we made like 30 grand from that in, I don't know, six months or something. Were they legit reviews? Were you sitting there playing Safari we, Solitaire? Or? We tried to make them uh, legit. But people were abusing it, of course, and they were like farming it out too. So they'd get like people in China to do a review, and then, <laughs> and then like you had to submit a screenshot, and some people faked them and whatever. Um, and it was almost certainly against Apple's terms of service too. Like it's not something they approve of, of course. So we were doing this, and it was his idea and stuff. And I was like, oh, I'd be fine to build this or whatever. Um, but that was like. I had this moment where I 
was walking into a movie theater, sat down, my phone buzzes, and I was like, oh, I need to turn my phone off. But I checked the notification and I had made 15 bucks. And I was like, this movie was free. This is amazing. Like that was the first time where I was like, I wasn't at the office making money. I was at the movies making money. Like that is awesome. It's true capitalism, digital capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, this is what like owning a business really feels like or should, where you're not trading your time for money. Right. So that I was really hooked at that moment. And I was like, whoa, this is sweet. So I had been consulting, working for other startups in St. Louis and around the, the country and stuff and just building software for them. But I was trading my time for money. You know, they were paying me to work on stuff and then I'd estimate it and give them a proposal and all that. But I always had to put in an hour to make an hour of money. Um, and that was not, it was just not fulfilling. You know, I got into programming because it was fun. And not because I wanted to do it for a job. And so... And even if you're freelancing, you're still... As much freedom as that is, you're just working hour by hour. However much money you can get paid per hour, it's always based on how many hours are you working. Yeah, and like the only way you can fudge it a little bit is like to tell them, I think this will cost you 1500 bucks, and not tie it to your hours. But you might... So you might put in, there's a project I did, I think that was 1500 and I worked on it for three hours. So effectively, I made 500 bucks an hour. But I can never go tell someone that I charge 500 bucks an hour because they'll be like, ha, 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 no. <laughs> like, I'm not paying that. And I wouldn't pay that. And I wouldn't feel comfortable asking for that even. Um, but even then, like, you can, you can give your proposal for this will be how much it will cost regardless of time. That can bite you really badly sometimes but like it's still at the end of the day wasn't it's not real leverage you know you're still trading the money for time and stuff so that app we built really taught me that where I was like oh man this is cool like I made money going to the movies this is sweet so it's really like um and have you ever seen those those games like the cookie clicker thing where you like click a button and it like increments this number and says you you click this button and we'll give you a cookie or whatever and you just sit there clicking this button and then at some point you like make enough money from these cookies that you've uh, created by clicking this button and then it it's like well you can buy an oven now and make two cookies every time you click this button and it just kind of teaches you about like automation oh, in a okay. sense sure. right all right so then then this idea of like building this app was like, we kind of automated this. So like, we don't have to do any work. Our users do the work and we just make money off of that. Like we built the system and they have to do the work and we just collect money off of this. That's really cool. So after we did that and kind of fell apart, I was like, I need to build something and sell it, you know, like a product for once. So I didn't know how to do any of this stuff and I tried to sit down and record screencasts and uh, programming is a job that's all 100% in your head. So to sit down in front of a camera and a microphone and code and think out loud was damn near impossible. It would be like, like trying to teach somebody the English language, just just yeah. start, just, you know, with yeah, nothing just, else. Yeah, just go. Yeah. Yeah, it was crazy and I didn't realize how hard it was going to be. Because my brain would like short circuit halfway thinking through something and then it'd be like, oh, what about this? Oh, what about that? And I was like, I realized I was like a squirrel, right? Like just jumping in between things, having no idea really what coherent thoughts I was having. So recording these videos uh, helped me slow down and actually think through what I was thinking and clarify my thoughts a lot, which was really good. But then at the end of that too was I had these videos that, I don't know, 100,000 people might watch, right? So if I teach one thing, it can be used by anyone in the world who's interested in that. So I could do this thing one time and then have unlimited, you know, number of people watching that, just like recording a podcast, right? Like we can record this conversation one time, but it could be listened to a hundred thousand times. Well, I remember when you were going through this like phase, cause both of us were running our own companies at that time. Yeah. I hadn't gone to work for Monsanto yet. And I remember 
that we were kind of coming to many realizations, which is why it was such a big benefit early on that yep. we were friends because you were like, if you want to write about something that people are going to listen to, have it be about a problem that you are actually solving. Yeah. You know, if you just yeah. sit down to be like, I'm going to create content, then that's bullshit. Nobody, nobody right. wants to hear that. But if what you do is you say, I had this problem and now I'm going to think through how would I explain how I solved it, all of a sudden other people that maybe they don't have that same problem, just like you're describing with the coding, but now I can move down a path that says like, oh, there's an, there's already a way to think about this. And mm -hmm. that really made me go much more rapidly towards the future. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what the podcasts like this are exactly that as well, right? You can watch this and be like, oh, that's interesting. I could think about the world this way. You know, like that's a whole different thing you might not have been exposed to. Well, you were the one that told and... me on, on this one too. Like I remember you were like, just start. And then yeah. fix the camera and then fix the microphones and then just keep fixing and making it better. And I remember being like, because you can, without a problem to solve, you become so dug into there's so many things that I could do that I don't know what to do. So mm -hmm. it's way better to be like, how do I record a podcast? And then it's how do I make it better and yep. better and better? Yep. And would you say that's the same thing with coding? Is, 100%. Is it? Yeah. I mean learning to code or like building a business either either one is like you just have to literally start with anything um because the problem is you're like oh i want to build facebook or something like that i want to build amazon well like they didn't know how to build facebook or amazon when they started so like you were in the same shoes as they were when they began and no one ever talks about that of course but that's the truth like Bezos was an like uh, he was uh, what was he in? He um, was in like finance, fi yeah, yeah finance, finance stuff. Yeah. And he like quit and was like, "I'm gonna do this internet thing," and like, and he was just books. People yeah. forget that that like, yeah. And even when that thing came out, my dad was a book collector, and he was uh, like, "Yeah, who wants to buy a book on the internet? I want to hold it. I want to feel it." Now it's like, I only go to the bookstore if on my way to a party I need a present <laughs> yeah. and I need it right yeah. now. Well, it's like, you know, books, uh, he could get rare books that you might not be able to find at your bookstore. So, like, there were advantages to that that people started to realize all of a sudden, like, yeah, you might want to feel the book before you buy it. But also, if you know the book you're looking for, then great, you've got it. You can just go, you know, order it and you, it'll show up at your door in a, a week or something. Um and that's like the the beauty of the leverage that you can do with software. Like this would be really hard to do if you had to go to every single bookstore in St. Louis to go find that one rare one you're looking for. And it might not even be here, which means you've got to go travel to Kansas City, Chicago, you know, a different city, and then go look at all their bookstores and see if you can find it or call them. And, you know, it's just an awful long process. You know so like the software allows you to just – say, hey, does this exist? I would like one. Yes, it, it does. Perfect. Here's my credit card, you know, send it to me. And like, it saves everyone so much time. It saves like, it helps the sellers because they don't have to do as much work. They can sell like I was doing instead of going to individual companies and saying, I can work for you and solve problems for you. I can now publish these videos and say, yo, if anyone's interested in Rails, and learning how to code in Ruby, you know, check these out. You don't even have to talk to me. Like, there's so many people, like, I was just at this Rails conference um, earlier, like, two months ago, and I hadn't been to that really since I had started um, doing these videos. And, like, it was weird to go around there. And well, we should people... say you're a Rails, you, you teach yeah. specifically about Rails. Yeah, so Rails is a tool to build websites, basically. So it's built on a programming language called Ruby, and Rails is built on top of Ruby to allow you to build websites. Um, and so some of the biggest websites in the world are, are built like with that. Um, GitHub is a huge one that developers use. Uh, Shopify, many people have probably heard of if you ever want to sell t-shirts or sunglasses or something online. Almost certainly you would go to Shopify and set up a store and start selling stuff through there. And all that's built on Rails and Ruby. So um, yeah, I was at the conference, you know, recently and there's all these people who I would sit down every time for lunch. 
or something, and I'd introduce myself, and they're like, oh, I just heard your voice in the office last week. Someone was watching one of your videos, that's and I was bizarre. like, yeah. that's insane. Yeah. Um, and I've never met these people, you know, and they've never, like, reached out to me, and they're just, like, numbers on my website. But that's, like, the leverage that I can have by creating this content and just publishing it, you know, and I get paid for it, too. So I publish a paid version or a paid video and a free video every other week. Yeah, um, I, I went and watched some of your uh, your unpaid videos just to yeah. see before we did this at Rails conferences. Then you're somewhat like a tribal celebrity. You're you're. Uh, it seems well known. so. Yeah, it's pretty funny because you always see those people at conferences that you're like, oh, he's that famous person. You know, everyone knows their name, and it's weird. But I guess I'm on the way up there too, which is really interesting and pretty cool so now and, and like th this is very different from say six years ago when i started and zero people knew who i was um like we were talking earlier about just starting something new i had to just go do it because um like i wanted to get out of consulting and so i just started to i and i tried to record videos i wanted to make a course and sell that but I'm a developer and I'm very uncomfortable doing sales or marketing or any of that. I don't even know how to begin, especially back then. So um, I recorded some videos and I hated listening to my own voice and all this stuff. It was, I was just like the worst person to start doing these courses. And so I had to like force myself to record 15 minutes a day, even if I threw it away. And it, I threw a lot away. But if I didn't sit for 15 minutes every day and listen to my own voice for a little while, I was never going to get through it. So I just was like, screw it. Like, it's 15 minutes. I can sit down and do it. And it was excruciating. Like, I hated it. And eventually I recorded like 15 videos. And I had five that I was like, I guess I'll give them away for free to hopefully get people to find my stuff. And then I'll sell the other 10 as a course. And I sold one every two weeks for 40 bucks. So my first month, I made a total of $80. And I was like, well, I'll never pay rent at this rate. Yeah, but how much were you <laughs> celebrating when the sale came through? Not a whole lot because I was like, this oh, is bullshit. never going to... No it, way. It, no was way. Like, it was exciting to, to have someone buy it and a stranger especially. But like... At that point, you're like, I'm because I had quit consulting and I was gambling on this because I knew my own. And, and this is the hard thing I think a lot of people struggle with. I did especially is like you have to know your own psychology and then confront it before you talk yourself out of it. Right. So I was sitting there like, oh, God, like I want to start this, or like start a business on the side. And I was doing that for years and years. And then when we built that little iOS review thing, um, that was like, okay, you know what? Like, I know myself. I've been doing this for years and never made a dollar. Like, we built a few apps but never sold any. And so then I was like, I'm going to burn the bridges. Like, I'm going to quit consulting 100%. So January 1st, 2014, I was completely done with consulting. Just like a month before, I was talking with some friends about joining their company as a co-founder, a consulting company. And I was like, you can either commit real hard to go continue doing the thing I hate or like burn the bridges and do nothing else and say like, if I don't figure this out, then at least I tried. And so that was when I was like, I have to do 15 minutes a day. And it took me like three months to record 15, like 10 minute videos. Right. It was awful. And then I get to this point where I'm like, cool, I made two sales, but like, I was excited about the sale, but then immediately afterwards, I was like, I'm never going to be able to pay rent. And I like, my savings is dwindling. Like, I don't, I had maybe a year's worth of savings, but you, you know how long. You lived a pretty frugal life. I mean, yeah, like, yeah. Uh, you know, you, well, you were so not like, flashy or... Well, so like, here's what happened. I graduated from Southern Illinois University with a computer science degree. And then I moved to St. Louis uh, and I work for the Genome Institute and get paid uh, like 60K a year, right? So first job out of college. But the nice part was... It, it's more than double what my first job was. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it was like a decent salary, especially in St. Louis for my first job. 
And the big benefits, though, were it's the Genome Institute is part of Washington University, or WashU as we all call it. Um, and that allows me to go to grad school for free. My spouse can go to school for free. Like, benefits are fantastic, you know, all the benefits of a really nice school or, or working for one of them. And I didn't care about any of that. I hated school. Like, I contemplated multiple times of dropping out of college because. I just wasn't learning anything. Like I had the expectation that college, you were on your own. We're going to give you really hard challenges. And I was like, hell yeah, this sounds awesome. And then I get to college and it's like, we're taking attendance and you know, you have to go through these. So you didn't learn to code in college. No, I learned to code. Um, I mean, I learned some things on how to code in college, but my dad actually gave me a programming book in like seventh grade or something. Um, cause he had an Atari, we didn't have the Atari anymore, but he still had this Atari programming book and we had this Magnavox computer that had DOS on it. And it turns out that the Atari had a very similar basic programming language to the Magnavox computer we had. And I was able to mostly translate what was in that book onto what was on that computer. And so I like taught myself that, but the problem when you self-teach yourself, especially when you're in grade school, is you don't know any algebra, and uh, programming is all about variables and effectively algebra, right? You're right. What do you mean you need to know about algebra? You need to understand that you can, like, well, at least in programming, like, if you have a variable, like, when you're in math, you have, you know, X and Y and A and B and whatever. In programming, like, you have those same variables, and you can say X and Y. X is 1, Y is 2 whatever, uh, whatever values you want to put in them. I didn't understand that you could change those variables. So I built one of my first projects was building a hangman game. And I was like, that seems reasonable. But I didn't realize that you could reuse your code. So what happened was um, I built this hangman game and you could guess one character at a time uh, like you do in hangman. And so my code would split off in different directions. It would see which character you typed in, and it said, did you get it right? If so, we will go down this path, and if you got it wrong, we'll go down this path. And then on either one of those sides, uh, you have another version of that guess, and if you got it right, you go one way, and if you got it wrong, you go the other way, which creates like this giant... Enormous, yeah, decision giant, tree. Yeah, and it's horrible. And I'm not smart enough to realize, like, I can build that one thing and just kind of loop it around and just make one really concise thing in my code. So I ended up building this, like, it was like 30,000 characters. Like, it was a massive novel, basically, that I had written because I didn't understand how to code. And I didn't really understand, you know, programming is some math, but it's not as much math as most people think. Um, and if you know algebra, programming's not that hard. So I wrote this thing, and it was like, huge and I spent months working on it and then at some point in school I'm learning some things and I'm learning some stuff about coding from you know articles I've looked up online and I rewrite it eventually because the thing was that decision tree was so big that I decided I'm only going to allow three letter words so you, I have a very <laughs> limited decision tree and then I learned some stuff and rewrote it, and it went from 30,000 characters or something to 2,000. And it supported, like, any length of word or multiple words or all kinds of things. It had colors and all this other stuff. And, like, it was tiny in comparison. And, yeah, programming was very hard to learn and slow when I was teaching myself. Um, and then you also have this, like this perpetual feeling of I don't really know how to code because I didn't learn it formally, right? I didn't go to a school for it or a boot camp or anything. I was self-taught. And so you always doubt yourself that way. And it's really like awful because you probably end up learning stuff that's more practical that way because you're trying to build real things than you would in school where they're giving you just kind of trivial problems you know, to, to solve. And they're not necessarily that practical. So it was really interesting to learn that and then go into computer science in the university uh, and just realize, like, 
this is terrible. Like I learned all this a long time ago from the majority of it. And then it was like, I'm not learning anything here. And everyone's not interested in actually learning stuff. And then we, we had a good professor though, that um, Dr. Bouvier, who did give us some legitimate things where he was like, we're going to learn assembly, which is very, very pretty hard to like wrap your head around because you were more or less writing the ones and zeros that go into the computer. But the ones and zeros are kind of set up in where you translate them to words. And and so it's very low level, pretty hard to learn. And one of the challenging classes in the thing, but his thing was like, okay, imagine you're building the lunar rover and you've got a camera and the camera sends you some data and you just have this jumble of ones and zeros and we need to compress that and send it back to Earth. So how do you take this image and shrink it? And what you need to do is you need to go through the image. And, and the image is a bunch of pixels and the color for every pixel. So what you can do is you can pull out all of the colors in that image and build a little table of all your colors. right? So you build up this little table, a list of colors, and then you replace all the pixels in the image with their matching oh, ID wow. for so it. So you don't have to handle all colors. You only have to handle the colors that are, happen to be in that picture. Yeah, yeah. And so you also, any duplicate colors get shrunk a whole lot because instead of recording the color two times, which is more data, more text, you can just say, this is that color, color one. This is color one. This is color one. So we only have to store color one uh, one time, and then no matter how many pixels we have, we just tell it which color it was. You know, so that compresses it, and that saves quite a bit of data, especially probably on the moon where it's a lot of grays and you know dark colors and stuff. Um, it's a simpler you know example, but it worked really well, and I was like, "Whoa, this is cool!" Like I have no problem solving these kinds of problems. Like they're practical and they're fun. Like this is something I could see doing in a job. But most of the rest of the stuff we did wasn't really that practical. But the final project, we have two semesters to build a project for um, one of the departments in the university. So we ended up working for the admissions department. They needed to give tours of campus. You would fill out some information on their website. And their, their previous system was this. You'd fill out some information like your name and your email and what day and time you want to come. And then that goes and submits it to a thing that sends them an email. And then they copy that email into a spreadsheet. And then they have several people working on the spreadsheet, which accidentally copies it sometimes. And then they have two copies that they have to go back and try and merge at some point manually. And we were like, oh, we can build this. Like, we can build something better and fix it with Rails. So that was my senior project, a really good practical thing. Um, and so I actually built that. And we finish, and it's the end of the semester. And the departments are, it's kind of one of those things where it's an academic project where you might do your senior project, but no one ever uses it at the end because you leave, you graduate. Um, but I was like, I really want them to use it maybe I can convince them to pay me for it and I'll work on it, you know, on my free time or whatever, if they need any changes to it. So I actually convinced the school to pay me five grand a year to continue working on that, which was really cool. So, um, that ended up, I did that for several years, which was neat. Cause it was like, I kind of hacked the system where they paid me for my, you know, senior project. Um, and it covered like some pretty decent bills. Yeah, for man, that'd be great. Yeah. So, you know, th there was always that sort of entrepreneurial thing in me for a long time. Um, and I'm, I'm certain this came from my parents where uh, when I was little and my sister is like five years younger than me, my parents were doing woodworking and making crafts and we were going to craft shows and uh, selling these little, you know, Christmas trinkets and, and other things. And I was just like, always there, had to help, had to, you know, help them set up. And then I would go in the back room and watch TV for six hours or whatever. And, um, 
And I just grew up doing that. And I didn't realize it, but like my parents are 100% entrepreneurial. You know, they were doing that to pay for all the expenses of having a child, right? So I didn't notice this until sometime in that senior year of college, I found out about Y Combinator and San Francisco startup tech scene. And for everything. people that don't know what that is, what is that? So Y Combinator is a, it, it's almost like a little school um, that you go to for three months if you're starting a company. So you have an idea, you pitch it to them. If they like it, they'll fly you out and you pitch it to them in person. And then if they accept you, they invest like $120,000 into your company. You move to San Francisco for three months. 100% of your time is spent pretty much working on your business. And you go and attend these office hours with the advisors and other like successful CEOs and stuff. Like Zuckerberg comes out there sometimes and give talks or whatever. Uh, people like him, you know. So I found out about this because they tend to have a very like uh, interesting community of programmers around them because a lot of the companies they're investing in, at least in the early days, were software companies. So I stumbled into that and almost moved to San Francisco, you know, right out of college because I was like, whoa, this is cool. And I didn't end up moving out there because I didn't really find any jobs that were that good. But I actually applied to Airbnb back when there was like 25 people total. Whoa. And they were the interview I did remotely from my room on campus and uh, did a little coding challenge that was basically rebuild their search and all of that for, you know, here's rooms that we have available. This person searched this geographic location find stuff within five miles and then put together the prices and all of that. And I was like just a beginner programmer then, you know, I'd never done anything real. So uh, they ended up being on the fence and, and they were like, so I think we're going to tell you no because we're, we're on the fence, which is the right call, right? Um, Meaning so, that when they were hiring you, they were like, some of us want you, some of us don't. We're not really sure. So we're going to go with no because we aren't 100%. Right. We're not. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And I was like, that's fair. That I totally would do that too if I was hiring someone and I was on the fence, you know? Um, so that's when I like moved to St. Louis to work at the Genome Institute because the other half of this was like, I didn't, all of my family is in Illinois. So moving out to San Francisco, I would have no friends. I would know no one out there except for coworkers. And I was just like genuinely kind of afraid of doing that. Are you a pretty shy guy? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Um, so that was certainly one of those things that was like, too scary for me to do. Um, but moving down to St. Louis was like not a big deal. It's like 45 minutes from campus or whatever. So, um, you know, I, my parents hadn't traveled a whole lot and stuff, but, uh, at around the time that I was starting my, it was shortly after I was starting go rails, my business doing those programming videos. Um, my dad, uh, we went up, to Wisconsin on vacation and then my dad was like had some pain and stuff and then we came back home and then my mom called and was like your dad passed out in the shower and we took him to the hospital and uh, they found colon cancer oh, and he has man. to go into surgery oh. and so like this was something that we were all like super shocked by because like you know he's not that old and it's a colon cancer is pretty serious and then for him to pass out in the shower it must be pretty bad um so they they do the surgery and they're like he should be recovering in say four or five days something like that and like two weeks go by and he doesn't look any better you know in his room in the hospital and like the nurses can't say anything you know because they're they don't want to get in trouble or whatever I can't say anything against what the doctor said or whatever. And we're like, we probably need to get a second opinion because the doctor said, oh, just, you know, keep giving him time. He'll, he'll get better. And he was not getting better. And we we're like, what the hell is going on? And uh, so it turned out that, like, he wasn't healing and they had to do another surgery and stuff. And so, like, he's fine now and has no uh, 
no cancer or anything, but like there was several months of like, is he going to make it through this? The first thing was like, he may not make through the first surgery or whatever. Then he does, but he's not getting better. And then they were able to go and do another surgery, but it was so close to the other one that they had to do a, a colostomy bag and everything. And my parents were like, I think most concerned about that. Like having to poop in a bag. For the rest of your life. Yeah, yeah. not fun. But it, they said like if we give it, say, six months, we'll go do another surgery and attempt to like – get rid of that and if it heals and stuff then you won't ever have to use that for the rest of your life you know you won't have to have a colostomy bag um and luckily that all worked out but you know my parents were like i think more worried about that stuff when when i was like worried about is he gonna be alive or not like i don't care if he like has a colostomy bag that happens and it's not very common and it's kind of weird but it's also like who cares he's not dead um, and then now you're confronting the potential death of your father or actually yeah. looking at that and saying, what yeah. does this mean for me? So like, you know, that was one of those moments of like life's super short and you need to go do, you need to just go do stuff. So sometime around then, um, I was running out of money and on my own business, you know, making my 80 bucks a, m- a month. And I was like, I'm going to have to get a job. And I had like a year of savings, but about nine months in, I was like, I better start interviewing now because it can take some time to get a job. And so I found a, one of those Y Combinator companies doing the similar stuff and uh, joined them. But I was working remotely for them. And they were all in New York City except for one other person. And so there's a lot of those communication troubles with a remote job if you're not if everyone does not always communicate online when there are people who are remote it just doesn't work like too much lost communication so um that was when I left and I was like you know what life's super short if we're gonna make this company succeed you know I can't I'm not doing near what I could if I was in person because they're just not operating that way. So I decided I'm going to move to New York City. I, re- I remember yeah. that so well. You know, And it was just of, kind of a whirlwind, right? Like I just kind of was like, okay, I'm leaving. Like, I, see ya. <laughs> for most of my life, I've been the person that's like living somewhere for a while. And then I'm like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave. And you leaving was one of the first times that that had happened to me, particularly as an adult, where it was like, this is a guy, I see him at least once a week. And now he's just yeah. gone. And, yeah. and we didn't know if you were ever coming back. Yeah, I didn't know either if I was going to come back. Uh, It was just one of those things where I was like, I've always wanted to live somewhere else. So, you know, I should do it because, you know, going through that was like, and and my parents had always talked about traveling and stuff and just never did. You know, they were always just saving money and stuff. and, And I was like, but if you save money until you're old to go travel, then you're old and you can't travel like you could as you were younger. So well, like, and it's a totally different thing to be in New York city, to go visit New York and to actually yeah, live there yeah. and Germany. And that all was a things. huge, a huge shift. Cause I had to sell my car and my parents, you know, bought, <laughs> they bought my car cause I had ordered it from a uh, mini custom and it took like three months to build and we got to watch it get shipped over and, whatever. But I was like, look, this is, you know, this is just a possession. Like I need to not let this like make influence my decisions. Like I can get another car, no big deal, you know, but I can't get my time back. So if I want to go do this, I should go do it. So I moved to New York city for about a year. Um, and yeah, we, During that time, uh, I was working, and there's so many little things that you don't realize when you make a move like that, uh, which is why people in New York City tend to move a lot. You move to whatever's the easiest and most convenient like Mm -hmm. place, or or you're making decisions as if you lived in St. Louis, which place you would live in in New York City. So I I move into the one that's like a little bit bigger space because I work from home a fair bit. I wanted to have some space. But it's farther out uh, to be cheaper. Um, but as it turns out, if you work in Manhattan, you're never home. You get on the train in the morning, you go to Manhattan, and you come back home and go to bed. You don't even eat at home or anything. So, like, it, 
I made the decision based on how I lived my life here. And then I was walking in the rain 15 minutes to get to the train to go into Manhattan to walk another 15 minutes in the rain. And I was like, wow, I don't ever want to do that again. (laughs) Like, that was dumb. And there's just so many little things that you end up learning. Like, you don't have a laundry machine. You walk your laundry down the street and someone else does it, probably messes it up. And, like, it's just going to be that way. If you want to live there and you're not making 150K or more. Right. You know? So that was like a huge kind of culture shock for me. But then as I'm there, our startup decides that we're going to spend a month in Berlin um, and just kind of take a month to think about where we're going and what we need to change to get there and all of that. And so that was like that times two because... You know, New York was hard enough, but everybody speaks English there. Germany is a different place because I don't know any German. I learned a little bit of Spanish in high school, which I've mostly forgotten. And then going there, luckily Berlin's one of the more English-speaking cities in Germany. So, like, the the menus and the restaurants have German and then underneath in small text English for it. So... For the most part, I was okay. And what are you as a programmer doing in Germany? Like, why is there benefit in that? It's just to get away, right? So, like, the the coolest part about this was maybe a weekend or something, you are so far extracted from anything you're comfortable with. There's nothing there that you have that is anything like you, you had at home. You can't go to the store the same. You can't do anything. So, you're, like, so removed from your own life that you get really good perspective looking at how things are going you know, day to day at home. So I remember just having this weird, surreal moment of like looking at my own life from like the sky where I could see myself wake up, get out of bed, go to the train, go to Manhattan, go to the office, go to lunch, go back to the office, come back home. And I could like picture my life there and see that that's literally all it was. And I wasn't doing anything else. And it was, I didn't enjoy it. Uh, the company wasn't doing super well and like I had a super clear perspective on my own life and like that's really kind of the hardest thing to get where you can't honestly look yourself in the mirror that often unless you're like totally separated from your day-to-day life you know that's why people have bad eating habits and they can't kick them and that sort of thing because they just can't honestly like look at themselves because they always see it with their excuses tied to it And so that month in Berlin was like really hard, but really amazing. Um, And I'd never been to Europe before or anything like that. So like farthest I had been was like Toronto um, and Hawaii, you know. So those are not very far from home, basically. So uh, that just ended up giving me a huge perspective. And I was like, I have to quit my job. Like, I don't like it. It's not going in the right direction. Um, It's just not going to work out. So I come back and I'm trying to figure out how to leave and get back to my own business, which, uh, so the timeline was I quit my job consulting, start go rails, record videos, make $80 a month for a little while, then run out of money, go get this job at this company. And they bought go rails from me. Um, and that was because we're doing very similar things. So they, they didn't want it being conflicting. Um, and so, they didn't do anything with it and it was just kind of, I was still working on it. And when I was leaving, I was like, I would like this back. Um, and that was crazy because it went from $80 a month to about the time when I joined them, it's making like 450 a month. Then that year that I was in New York city, it grown to say 3,500 a month, which sounds great. But, uh, $3,500 3500 a month in New York City in Brooklyn, Manhattan goes virtually nowhere. Right. And I was making like 70k there and digging into my spend or savings just to live there like in I was eating super cheap and not spending hardly anything. Um and it was just 70k wasn't going to give you a good life there or whatever like it was a struggle. Um, which sounds crazy cuz 70k here in St. Louis It'd be is great living. Yeah. You know, fantastic. So I realized, like, I didn't have that many friends there. I'd only been there for a year. Um, maybe what I should do is, now that I have GoRails back, move back to 
St. Louis, and this would be plenty of money to get started here. I'd have to be very frugal, but it would be great. Um, and so I took that gamble, and it luckily grew significantly to the point where I was like, okay, this is a livable thing. And then at some point, it was like, okay, I might be getting paid now more on my own business than I would get at a job. And it just kind of continues growing over time, as long as you continue doing good work. And, and how is it now? Stuff. Um, yeah, it's fantastic now. So it is kind of fascinating because it's grown from something where I was like you know, at poverty line or lower to something now where I'm like, I'll probably have to hire someone to help me um, grow from now on, you know? So and it's all we'll yours, probably, right? You, you yeah. get, if you get upside, it's all, it's all your upside. Yeah. And it's, and it's been really interesting to like, cause, cause I can build it and work from home and work whatever hours I want. And it can also work with you. So like your job, if you have a job, you have to always deliver kind of whatever you're committed to all the time for this, like for my own business, there was a period of time where I achieved, like enough money to be comfortable. And I started just to narrow down, like how little can I work? And I was working like one day a week and making a full salary. And I was like, this is kind of awesome. But like mentally I needed that, right? Like I was exhausted and it had taken several years to get to that point, like three years. And I was like, I think I make like 50 or 60 K and I can at least make that with putting in very minimal amount of time and I'm happy to not make more money just to have this like freedom and like be able to work so little. That was really cool. And then over time I like grew out of that where I was like, okay, I'm kind of bored now. I need another challenge. And so I built another product and launched that and just launched another one uh, last week. Um, and so over time then you like figure out what parts of those businesses are working and what you want to optimize for. So that one, I was like, how little time can I put into making videos? Um, and it really helped too, to have another project because I, as I'm working on that, I can take lessons I learn and teach them in videos. And then that made that even easier. And I could focus more on this and grow that and just kind of, you know, I, I had all of the options to go in any direction I wanted so long as they continue to pay the bills. Right. So that was a lot of freedom that I ended up with that I didn't understand, you know, when I started. Because I turned 30, uh, like, in, in at the end of May. And I always had these goals of, like, and I, I, I have a, like, draft blog post I need to publish on this. But I had a goal of, like, I want to be a millionaire by 30. That was, like, the the lofty goal I had. And it's funny because a million dollars when you're in business – thinking about it in terms of like hiring people million dollars is almost nowhere like a hundred thousand dollar salary is low for a developer right these days and now so, you've got a business that's generating money at the level that lets you that, that yeah. you could do that yeah, yeah. And, and that's that was the longest struggle too is like you are first working to build your own salary and you get a bare minimum salary then you work hard to get to a comfortable salary so you don't feel like, gosh, why am I working so hard? I should just go get a job because it would pay me double and, you know, it'd be easier. But then at a point you achieve that and then you're like, okay, well, if I work a little bit harder, I can make more money than I could in a normal job. And then if I work a little bit harder, then I can hire someone else, cut my salary back down to what was comfortable, but now I do half the work or something or like... We can do twice as much work and maybe make, you know, three times as much money or something. So you get a lot of leverage over time, but it's very slow and you have to be patient. Um, but yeah, like the, going back to that blog post, like the million dollars was never about the million dollars because I was always thinking about this as a kid. Like I imagine a million dollars allows me to just do anything I want to do without having to you know, yeah, I mean, that's, a, a that's what a million something. dollars is. It references the um, <clears throat> financial independence that people want. Yeah. Right? And so yeah. You, what you're really saying when I want to have a million dollars is I want to have enough capital or the value of my work or whatever is enough that I'm not dependent on any one thing. Yeah, you're not you, – you, you have freedom of time, location, whatever. 
um, and financial freedom or whatever. So like I realized at some point I got that because I ended up with, you know, those where I could work one day a week. I got time freedom then. And then I was like, well, now that I make more money, I kind of have, you know, location freedom where I could go travel and spend a month a year there and work from there if I wanted. Um, and you ended up with like a lot of these other things. You, you also have more responsibilities because at a job, you're like, you don't have to worry about payroll taxes, you know, none of that stuff, no legal things, no, no designers, if you're, if you're a developer at least. Um, and you just worry about the code and you don't have to even do customer support or anything. But, you know, as a business owner, you have to do all of those things yourself and you don't have money to go hire a bookkeeper or a good lawyer or whatever. And so you got to kind of be scrappy for a while. But then over time, you like find a good bookkeeper or something and eventually you make enough money where you're like, it is worth paying this person to save that time and I make enough money that I can do that responsibly and stuff. And it just takes super long time. But then you get to a level of like freedom that you can't really go back. Like only working for yourself will ever give you that much freedom, you know? And it's such a cool thing. And um, sadly, like in in theory, everyone is going to be able to achieve that in the future, I think, I hope. But then you see all these Grubhubs and Amazon deliveries where they're renting U-Haul trucks to deliver your packages and stuff. And you're like, I don't know because... A lot of this gig economy thing that people talk about where they're working for Uber or Lyft or whatever, they're all kind of working for minimum wage. But they get to work for themselves and work their own hours, and a lot of people are willing to trade that. Uh, you know, we won't make a $70,000 a year, but we can work closer to minimum wage, but we can work anytime we want. You know, and so that may be a thing people are willing to trade off for, which is now kind of enabled by the internet where we have that leverage where we can use that and say I just want to work at nights so I can spend the time with my kids during the day or whatever like you have more time to or more flexible ways of doing that so it's kind of cool to see that stuff change but you know unless you really own the business it's not it's not going to pay super well. I had a really fascinating conversation with a guy. I got invited out to the American Enterprise Institute, and they had like this think tank kind of weekend. Okay. And I got to meet all these really interesting people from all over the country. And I, um, the guy brought up the point that social media is um, – so in the United States, we pride ourselves on being a meritocracy. Does it have problems? Sure, right? But yeah. like it is, can you come up with a program that people want to buy things from you mm-hmm. on your program and then you can make money, right? And and so it's how good are you at doing your thing? You right. move up in the hierarchy. And he was saying, well, social media isn't like that. It's not a meritocracy. It's an honor culture. And that in effect, in an honor culture, you have honor and shame. And there And there's no limiting factor on how much shame you can have because once you've decided that somebody is not a part of your group, you want them gone. Obliteration to the absolute maximum. And that really uh, made a lot of sense to me about yeah. the – about the like you're playing this zero-sum social hierarchy game. And w- the reason that people band together, I think, and share articles that have very little substance is because they're like, yeah – yeah, that guy's bad and he's doing bad things and mm-hmm. we're on the good side, right? We're all on the good side together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Naval Ravikant talks about that too where he's like, you know, there there are several sort of hierarchies that you can work up in and, you know, money and business is one thing where if you make good stuff, then you make money and you rise up the ranks and everyone else can too. Um, but in the social sphere of things like social media and stuff, it is – you can't get ahead unless someone else goes down or whatever. And so like they're, they talked about that in one of his podcast episodes or something um, or on the Joe Rogan episode on, uh, he talks on about it in both his podcast and I think the Rogan. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a great point. And it's very much very similar to that where in order to get higher, like, like social political status, you have to talk down about someone else in order to rise yourself up. 
And it's just like an awful game to play. And so you should effectively just try not to play it at all. Um, you know, and, and yeah. I, I mean, I guess maybe that's the answer right there, right? Like, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't care about this. The, I mean, the, the thing, the thing that like, uh, is always a joke of like, um, have you seen that meme of, um, Elon Musk and Peter Thiel when they look like young nerds at the computer holding up their like PayPal logo and stuff? Um, <laughs> and then there's one of like Bezos when he's young oh, starting yeah, Amazon him, yeah. and he looks like just a young nerd and both of those show them now where they're like buff and like rich and crazy and everything. And, and they're like, you know, uh, what, whatever they're like, he, uh, the first like quote on the first one is like, you know, and he's just like this poor little nerd, like, I hope I can do this. And then the next one's like, I can do whatever the heck I want. <laughs> like, and like, that's exactly the game you should play too. You know, like speaking of uh, people that we follow, you are the guru of finding awesome new people. I mean, you were the one that turned me on to Peter Thiel's zero to one and yeah. uh, Naval Ravikant. But uh, who, who are you listening to lately? Mm, you know, I don't know. Um, I was listening to a lot of uh, Chamath Palihapitiya, but he's kind of, he had an interesting time uh, recently. He's an investor. He was one of the, he's like number 20 at Facebook and was um, on the growth team. So they were the team that figured out that uh, on Facebook, if you got an added 10 friends, seven friends in 10 days or 10 friends in seven days, you basically never left. Um, so they found this data point and were like, whoa, like every single person who achieves this never leaves and we can grow our platform and business to be giant. Um, once they found that, they could focus all their attention on how do we get people to join and add those number of friends within that time period and voila, you know, we will rocket ship. And uh, so he made a ton of money from Facebook's IPO and stuff. And then has gone on to do investing, and and I've always found him interesting because in a similar similar vein, he talks about investing in companies on sort of the merits to humanity. And there's a lot of people who are doing investing in things like Uber and stuff, and they're doing it based on like we know we can make a lot of money off of this. Um, and his is his philosophy is like look. Um, I invested in a company that's going to put a sensor in your toilet and we'll do a urine sample test every time you pee. So we can detect cancer or other things so far in advance because we're going to test your urine all the time, every day. Like, how cool is that? Rather than the rare occasions you go to the doctor and they do a urine sample. Um, so those sorts of things are the ones he's like, if this is going to be good for humanity in general, then those are the ones I should invest in. Cause if we can make it work, it's going to be worth, you know, trillions of dollars. You know, we could create something like, uh, a, it's also kind of funny because your top three companies are Apple, uh, Microsoft and, and Amazon. And those are like just kind of the same company in a sense, you know, Apple and Microsoft are very similar. Um, they build software and computers and then Amazon is just selling things and there, there's not a whole lot of other core things. Like those biggest companies are all very focused on tech and software. Um, so, you know, a healthcare company that creates products like that and makes so much strides in preventative medicine will just be easy to skyrocket into the trillions of dollars, you know, at some point because they're doing something that will just be kind of like literally every toilet should have that, you know, or something like that. So, so how did you find Chamath? That, that's, that's one of the things that's so it's a, interesting. It's a great point. Uh, I don't know. A lot of these people will surface on Hacker News or um, people I follow on Twitter. So a lot of – it tends to be that a lot of these people um, already are connected. And so if you find one – you'll often eventually find these other ones. But you have to be kind of careful because there's a lot of like not so great information. And I tend to follow those people who are a lot more like philosophical. Like Naval is a, which is funny if you read the conversations about his interview on Joe Rogan, 
all of the comments are like, this guy is full of crap. Like, he's just talking in platitudes and blah, blah, blah. And not oh, really I didn't saying the anything. comments didn't like him. On, on Hacker News and stuff. It was hilarious. Because oh. they're all like this very engineering focused. They want concrete advice, tactics, and whatever. And it's like, that is not how, like, if you have principles and a philosophy that you follow, all the tactics follow follow. Like, they're just naturally going to come out of that because you follow your, your principles. Um, and so these people are like ones who won't ever really get that far. Cause they're looking to, you know, just copy tactics and they're not, they can't be creative then. Right. Because they don't have any guiding light that they're following or whatever. You know, you, so, you, so I tend to gravitate towards those people and they're kind of rare. You were talking about the 15 minutes of discipline that you had to get yourself mm-hmm. in front of the camera. That actually got me thinking about um, a strategy that I think I've told you about this, the sticker sprints. So mm. my friend Nick Cizek, uh just was telling me like his, he's kind of off on his own too. So I talked to him and he was like, well, when I was going to get my PhD, I figured out that what I needed were blocks of uninterrupted time, mm. but I didn't need it. So it was like a huge block. I needed something that would be accomplishable. So what I do is um, I turn off all of my email my text messages, any way to get a hold of me. And I set a timer for 45 minutes. And then once I hit the button, then I'm only working on whatever that thing was in front of me. And Uh then at the end of 45 minutes, I I am totally comfortable with being halfway through a sentence, but I stop as close to that as I can, because now I've got something to hang on to, like to come back to and grab on to. I like that. I don't, I don't finish it all the way Intentionally. Not finishing it. Right. That's interesting. And so then if you do three sets of 45 minutes, you get a sticker. And your goal is to build up the number of stickers that you can get in a day. How many, How much time mm. can you spend huh. doing this focus? And it has been a miracle for me. That's super cool. I haven't. I don't think we've talked about that, but it's very similar to the, have you heard of the Pomodoro technique? Uh, this is somewhere around this, yeah. It's just, it's very simple. It doesn't really work for me um, because it doesn't have those, like those nuances of you should intentionally finish things halfway. I did that last night, not on purpose, but uh, I left to go hang out with you guys, and I was in the middle of coding on something, and I left it there, half finished, and I knew what my next thought was going to be, but I know I can go home and pick that up exactly where I left off, because I I left it with a thread that I can hang on to, versus like completing that thing, and then... Next time, I'd have to sit down and figure out what I want to start working on. Well, and this hits on exactly what you were talking about with programming. Like, one of the hardest things for people to do in order to become productive or even just to start is to know where to start. Yeah. Right? Like, like that is, I think, one of the things that holds people back the most. Uh And we've talked about the concept of resistance, right? Like, the voice that when you wake up in the yeah. morning and you know you should go for a run, but there's this voice that says like, it's a little cold out or oh, yeah, you, did, yeah, you worked yeah. too hard yesterday or you should, you know, and that resistance actually occurs throughout your life, right? And in, in every single area, I think that resistance is the highest and I think it's good to name it on projects where I don't know where to begin. Yeah. So the idea absolutely. of just like, I'm going to start and be totally fine with not knowing where this thing is going and, and building from there. Absolutely. Um, I, I know I've told you the story before, but uh, there was a guy that um, he did this thing called rejection therapy. And, oh. <laughs> and it's so amazing. Uh, it went viral because so he would record himself and his challenge was to go into, say, Starbucks and just ask for 10% off. You know, order something, but you have to ask for 10% off just out of the blue. And like, just put yourself in conversations where you know you're going to be told no. Um, And intentionally ask for things that you will be told no. Um, And so he goes into Krispy Kreme one day and asks for, it was hilarious. Like, I would certainly expect to be told no for this. He goes in and he asks for uh, five donuts and he wants them to be the colored in the olympic rings <laughs> and so the lady instead of saying no she goes uh hold on give me a minute and she goes back and he sits down and he's recording this on his phone and sits down at this table across from the the cashier register and he's like 
super freaking out in the video. Like, because normally oh. they just tell him no. Yeah, and he's like, "Okay, I got it over with. I can leave now." And blah blah blah. And he's now like, "Oh God, I asked her to do this thing, and I like, I wanted her to say no, but she said yes. Like, what do I do now?" And so she goes and actually cuts the donuts and gets the icing to match all the colors. She Googled it to make sure she got it right and then brings him a a box with all of them in there, all colored icing and everything. And he's like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much. This is amazing. Like, I am super sorry (laughs) that you had to do that. And he posted online and, like, the Internet was like, this person needs a raise. And so the Internet loved it. And he, like, had this amazing lesson out of there. It was like, you don't get what you don't ask for, you know, but you also, you also, like, are worried about rejection and you got so wrapped up in, like, I want the no that you forgot that you could get a yes on asking for hard things. And uh, so then he, like, had this fascinating moment that everybody was like, that's really interesting, this rejection therapy thing. And then um, they, like, people were contacting Krispy Kreme corporate and like found the lady and her name and were like, you guys need to do something for her or whatever. And uh, yeah, I think she got promoted or whatever. Oh, what a great story. The battery gods have spoken and we are running (laughs) out of battery. So I want to actually take a little bit of time. You produce stuff that is for regular people. You have two podcasts and what are their names and where can people find them? Well, one of them is for programmers. It's called remote Ruby. Um, and I forget, it's remoteruby.transistor.fm. If you Google it, you'll find it. We don't really have domain set up yet for them. Um, but that one's for programmers, and we just talk about you know stuff and interview people that are other programmers and, and just kind of explore what it's like to be a developer and all that good stuff and what's changing, new things, you name it. Um, that's a fun one. Probably the bigger one because that's what my business revolves around. You know, it fits in well with all those things. And then I have another one called Business Time, which uh, a friend out in California and I, who we've never actually met in person, um, but we've been friends through GoRails since like the beginning. He and I do a podcast talking about um, just running a business. So we're talking about marketing and he's trying to launch a product and, and get something out um, for genetic counselors and his wife is a genetic counselor. And so they're building software for them because they have to manage their licenses and, um, renewals and all that stuff. And it gets kind of hairy. Um, so we do that and talk about his building up his business, marketing it and same thing for mine. So it's pretty fun to just kind of explore those things. Like what should we try and try and give updates on, we did this last week. Here's the results we saw and so on. So this next one, because uh, last Monday I launched that new product. Uh, this next episode we'll record probably later today. Um, we'll dive into kind of the launch of that and how it's done and, and some, you know, edges around there and like what I'm going to do in the future and that sort of thing. So it should be fun. And you are on Twitter? Yep, at exid3, E-X-C-I-D-3. I'll throw a link. Pretty much everywhere. Uh, That's my domain, my email, Twitter, GitHub. Yeah. Well, (laughs) Chris, uh, you have been an absolute uh, pivotal person in my life that uh, I'm sure will be around many, many more times. We'll bring you back to talk about other fun and exciting things. And uh, eventually we'll have Rob on here. He's not doing that. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. So, Thank you so much for coming by. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for sticking around, everybody, to the very end. This was a great interview with my good friend, computer programmer and entrepreneur, Chris Oliver. I'm so glad you stayed, and I hope that you'll hit that like button or consider giving me a review and sharing it with your friends. These types of activities are a small action, but it really spreads the podcast out, and I have been absolutely astounded with how quickly the podcast has grown. In fact, it's made it easy for me to get some of the next podcast guests uh, on the docket. I have uh, a friend from the West Coast that is flying all the way here. He's a dairy farmer, and uh, he's going to talk about some of the issues going on in dairy farming, kind of farming in general, and uh, talking about things like activists and the vegan community. This should be a very interesting interview. Another interesting one is uh, one of St. Louis's most well-known chefs, a James Beard award-winning chef, has agreed to come on the podcast, so I'm pretty excited about that. We should be able to get it this month. And also, 
Uh, if you've ever been interested in learning more about the cannabis industry, I have a good friend that uh, has done well in that industry and um, is going to talk about what it was like starting a firm out in Las Vegas as recreational marijuana became available and what he learned along the way and kind of what his thoughts are on what's going to happen in the future. So I hope you subscribe and stay tuned. This podcast just keeps getting better and better. And thank you so much to people that have been writing me with your support, with your comments, and with helping me figure out where to take this podcast in ways that my audience wants to see it go. So thanks so much, and uh, we'll see you next week.